we will be starting back with our normal Bible study. Uh, we are uh, finishing up with the book of Acts, and we'll be going into Romans uh, and the letters of Paul as we do an overview of the New Testament, uh, which is very important to know. There are, there are different categories of knowledge that we have, and so often, you know, Americans, uh, we just, we want just one little sliver. And this whole idea of a, a verse for the day kind of commentary or, or, or daily devotion, uh, which I'm not downing, but, but that is, is something entirely different than understanding the Word of God. Um, and to understand God's Word, to be able to interpret it properly, you need to have both the forest and the trees. And if you've ever heard that analogy of not seeing the forest for the trees, but there's other people that don't see the trees for the forest. All of us have a, a, a propensity towards one or the other. And we need to overcome that and learn both because only in knowing both the overview, and the specifics, do we really begin to see God's will. So I hope that you'll come out and join us as we start into uh, the letters of Paul uh, and go through them uh, in the order that they are in the Scripture, which is not uh, the order in which they were written. It's not the chronological order, uh, but it is uh, uh, based on a different thing, and we'll be talking about that probably this week. So please uh, come out and join us. Well, we've had an interesting week ourselves this week. I guess about the middle of the week, I got a phone call. I was surprised. It was like 9.30 at night. Uh, Wake in America phone line rang. I answered it. And it was a fellow out, and I think he said he was out in Marlton. And somehow he got one of our tracks, and he called to find out about Wake in America Ministries. And I had a chance to talk with him. He's supposed to be sending me his address to send him some additional tracks. But it's interesting how people are, all of a sudden, they'll come out of the woodwork and uh, contact you. And then again, let's see, when was it? Friday, Friday night, we were out to dinner and we gave out a number of pocket calendars. And then in last night, we were at the uh, Broadway show. I don't know how many of you like Elvis, but uh, we were at the Elvis show last night at Broadway in Pittman. And uh, I had mentioned a while ago that we had met a girl who works in the concession stand, Christina. And uh, we bumped into her last night and told her we were praying for the things that she had asked for. And it was great because she remembered us and we had an opportunity to share and encourage her as a Christian. And there was one other thing I had. Oh, yeah, Th this was really a cool one. Uh, yesterday morning, I went over to the bank. We go to, uh, which is First Harvest now. And as I'm walking in, if you've ever been in that bank, there's an ATM machine between the double doors. So I walk in, and uh, there's a gentleman there taking some money out of the ATM. And I said, good morning to him. And he turned around, and he looked at me with a stare. Who are you? And I says, I don't know you. You don't know me, but good morning to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father, thank you for hearing us. The Bible says that we know that God does not listen to sinners. Lord, that's all of us. But if anyone desires to do His will, Him He hears. Lord, may we be people who seek Your will. And today as we pray, may we pray not for what we desire. May we not come to You with our laundry list of lusts and, and cravings and ask you to rubber stamp our desires, many of which would be bad for us. May we instead seek your will, that we might have that which is perfect and pleasing, that we might be a people who shine like the stars in heaven. Lord, we ask that you would guide and direct our thoughts. Oh, Father, I just want to praise you for being good. Lord, you have been so good to, to us, 
to the undeserving. Lord, we look at the devastation in the Ukraine and brings to mind the, the devastation of World War II, just mile after mile of lives destroyed. But even in that, you have been at work. Oh Lord, we so often crave ease, comfort, peace. But how often your hand is shown in the opposite. How easy it is to take you for granted when we have the blessings we've received. How important it is to understand how good you've been. Lord, we give you praise and worship and glory. We praise you and thank you. We pray for our nation. Lord, I don't pray for your blessing. I pray to be made blessable. I don't pray for your presence. I pray for you to make us people who invite your presence. I don't pray for your forgiveness. I pray for your transformation. Lord, I thank you that you are a God of stubborn love. When we read through the lay of the Old Testament, 2,000 years of history. And if there is one theme, it is the theme that you always come back. You never let them go. And even when you let them go, it was only to prepare to bring them back. Oh Lord, I pray that you would transform our nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 9, 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up into heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into the Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people did not welcome him because he was headed for Jerusalem. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. And when they were walking along a road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air had nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I want it today, as we prepare next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Two weeks from today is Easter. I want to talk today about Jesus being determined. If you look at verse 51 in our text today, I want you to notice what it says. Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He determined he was going to go. We 
live in a day when so often Christianity is sold as you getting what you want. But as we look at this, we see that Jesus didn't go through life demanding what He wanted, but doing what He was commanded. And He resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, this isn't the first time He'd done that. He, he practiced this before. And I remember when I was a kid, I grew up in the late 60s and early 70s. I was born in 59. But I don't remember the 50s. I just thank God I'm not a child of the 60s. But I was a child of, of, of the late 60s and early 70s. That's when I really began to understand the world. And it was the day of the very height of the Cold War. And as we look across the world and we see Russia being humiliated in the Ukraine, I remember the day when everyone was terrified of the Soviet Union. They were advancing. Vietnam was falling and then had fallen. Korea was a stalemate threatening to explode at any moment. Angola, Cuba, Honduras, Colombia, all across the world, the communist movement was flourishing. And I remember believers would talk about if the Russians ever come here and try to grab my Bible, they'll have to take it from my... Yeah. And, and that impressed me as a kid. Wow, what dedication! What I didn't understand is, it's not some proclamation of what you'll do in a grand gesture, but the everyday obedience that determines whether you do the will of God. It's not talking about some grand thing that you'll do. Now Jesus has come to a grand thing. He is going to Jerusalem to die. But that wasn't the test. It's not the first time he did that. Now look at the first time. It's found in John chapter 11. Jesus had been in Jerusalem in John chapters 9 and 10. There he healed the man at the pool of Siloam, right there in, in the midst of the temple area. The Pharisees witnessed it. They're angry. The crowd saw it. Everybody's impressed. Everyone's jubilant. Here's this man that not only had gone blind, but was born blind, and the people are just overwhelmed. And the response is they try to kill Jesus, and he withdraws. And he goes down to the Jordan River. Why there? Because John's disciples were still there. The Pharisees didn't really dare come down there because to do so would invite a riot. And Jesus is down there teaching, and a messenger arrives and tells him, your friend is very sick. Please come at once. But they stick around for days and days. And finally, Jesus says, okay, time enough, Lazarus is dead. Now, first he tells him he's asleep. And the disciples say, oh good, he'll probably heal if he's able to sleep. Jesus goes, no, that's not what I mean. He's dead. So let's go to Jerusalem. And they stare at him and go, you wouldn't go when he was sick and you could have healed him, but now that he's dead, you want to go? And if you look at verse 14, so then... John eleven fourteen, 14. 
He told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there, so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, Let's go also, so we may die with him. They understood the risk. They understood the danger. When Jesus said, let's go back to Jerusalem, he was risking his life. Now we come to Luke 9, and he's no longer risking his life. He's sacrificing his life. He, he's not going there with the threat he might be in danger. He's going there knowing he will die. Now, we need to understand he didn't want to do this. He didn't want to go. How do we know? Well, look with me over at Matthew's Gospel. Here's what he prays when he gets there. Here's what he prays when he gets there. Matthew 26, 38. Matthew 26, 38. Then he said to them, my soul is sorrowful, overwhelmed with sorrow, to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is Possible. May this cup be taken from me. He didn't want to be there. It wasn't his will. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, He endured the cross, despising the shame. We've lost in American Christianity the idea of sacrifice. We've turned God into the heavenly rubbing lamp. If you just rub the right way, you'll get what you want. The prayer of Baez, bless me, bless me. Jesus understood that doing God's will was not always doing what we want. He didn't want to go to Jerusalem because he didn't want to go to the cross. But what does Luke tell us? He resolutely set his face. Can I ask you a question today? Can you think of a time in your life when you knew God wanted you to do something or not do something? And you really wanted to do the opposite. You wanted to do that thing or you wanted to do the opposite of that thing, but you knew what God wanted and you resolutely set your face and said no. It doesn't have to be a big thing. You don't have to wait for some grand gesture. I'm going to Jerusalem to die. What does Luke 16 tell us? He who is faithful in little things will also be faithful in 
big things. He who is unfaithful in will be unfaithful. Look at how Luke tells this same account as Matthew. Look at Luke chapter 22. Luke 22. Look at verse 42, Luke 22, 42. He prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Now, that doesn't describe how he said that. But this does. Look at verse 44. And being in anguish. He prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Do you understand that Jesus prayed with more passion, with more agony than all the other prayers that have ever been prayed? If you were to stack up all the prayers of Jeremiah and the prophets, and those people that the Bible says they wept beside the river in their exile in Babylon. If you were to pile those all in a heap, and then you would have gone through the prayers of every dungeon, and every rack, and every torture that was done to God's people, that Jesus prayed with more anguish than all that combined. He prayed so hard that he literally sweat blood. That's how much he didn't want to go. And yet he determinately set his face to go to Jerusalem. Remember other people in the Bible? Remember Jonah? God said, go north to Assyria. And Jonah set his face to go in the opposite direction as fast as he could. Not Jesus. Jesus, knowing the agony he would feel, knowing the desperation he would experience, knowing what it would cost him, he determinately set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he got a little support. When he stopped at that Samaritan village, it says they wouldn't receive him. They told him, get lost! Because they knew where he was going. And they didn't want any part of it. You ever feel like when you try to do the right thing, when you, we, when you know what you need to do, and you try to do it, that nobody backs you? I knew someone that used to say, every time God calls me to crawl out on a branch, it seems he hands the devil a chainsaw. You see, here's what we need to, to know. That our natural inclination is almost never the right one. When we do what comes naturally, it is almost always the wrong thing. 
generally speaking, we would be much better off of doing the opposite of what we think is right. What does Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 tell us? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Anybody know? You do once you get there. 63. We said it back there. My ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. As as the earth is, is lower than heaven, as heaven is higher than earth, So my thoughts are higher than yours and your thoughts are lower than mine. You see, becoming a believer isn't just about a get out of hell free card. Being a believer is about surrendering my will to His. That's what we're taught to pray, right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you think there's ever a time that God says, Hey, Michael. Michael goes, I'm busy. I've got a job for you. What is it this time? Well, I want you to, I'll get around to it. Can you imagine? And and here's the testimony that you have if you're a believer, right? I want to spend eternity in heaven where every single being in existence there leaps to do his will that's what heaven is isn't it that's why Paul writes in Romans chapter 12 Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Uh, I'm going to give you a word out of the King James, just because I love that word. It's, it's one of those words that just, uh, you know what an um, homonomapia is? Yeah, uh, it's a word that sounds like it sounds, a homonomapia. Weird word, but what it means is it's a word that sounds like it means. The Batman used to do them all the time. Pow! Zap! Boom! Bang! They sound like they are. Their meaning is the same thing as their sound. Uh, this word just strikes me that way. It, it just the, the King James translates that, I beseech. That word just, for me, sounds like what it is. It's just, the the, the NIV says, I urge. I urge you, brothers, I beseech you, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. I beseech you, surrender your will. Don't do what you want to do. Now, I want you to think about it. God doesn't force anyone. 
God could. Isn't that true? God could make us. Notice he says, I I beseech. Uh, I forget the translation that says, I beg you. I beg you. God doesn't make you. Surrender yourself the way Jesus did when he set his face to go to Jerusalem. I want you to notice the second thing about that. Look at verse 2. It says, And do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. People all the time go, Oh, I wish I knew God's will. I wish I knew God's will. There's only one way to know God's will, and that is to surrender to it. God is not in the habit of being an advisor. He doesn't give you 30 choices and say, Hey, I think this is good, but this is okay, and this one would do too, and just take your pick. God only tells us what His will is when He knows we're willing to do it. So often, people say, oh, I never seem to hear from God. God doesn't direct me. Because He knows you don't want to go where He wants you to go. He doesn't tell you to go to Jerusalem because He knows you won't go there but knowing the cost knowing the pain knowing the suffering knowing the agony Jesus resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem Now, here's the thing that that the church in America doesn't teach. Although God only asks it, He doesn't make us do it. It is a requirement. Look with me at 1 John 2, verse 17. 1 John 2, verse 17. Now, you should know that passage, 1 John Chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. Again, it's one of those verses that isn't taught much in the church today. But it's one that needs to be. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these aren't of the Father, but are of the world. The world and its lusts pass away. And then there's that wonderful but of salvation. But. And I want you to see the words that follow that but. Because the words aren't what the church in America so often proclaims. The one who prays a prayer. Doesn't say, but the one who prays a prayer or walks an altar or signs a card or joins a church. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. That's why the psalmist, look what the psalmist says, Psalm Psalm 40, the 40th Psalm. Look at 
verse 8. We'll start at verse 7. Psalm 40, verse 7. Then I said, Here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O my God. Those the words that blazed in Jesus' heart as he entered Jerusalem that day. Here I am. Everything that's about to happen, here I am. I long to do your will. That's my desire. Now it's interesting. We didn't read the very end of Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Then you will know what is God's will. His good, pleasing will. When you finally surrender to God's will, you find out that it's good no matter what you have to go through. What's the end of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 say? He endured the cross, despising the shame. But what's the words right before it? For the joy set before him. God's will is good and pleasing, but only when you're on the inside. you to notice. Turn with me to John. We looked at how John, Jesus practiced that trip to Jerusalem with Lazarus. He waited until it was too late for his friend and then he went back knowing the risk. He practiced that obedience that would come when he took that final trip to Jerusalem. But that wasn't the only practice he received. Look with me in John's Gospel. Look at John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 34. John 4.34 My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of Him who sent me. Why did Jesus pick the word food? Well, in the context, it was part of the conversation. But it's more than that. There are few things in this world that we long for more than food. We live in an age of instant gratification. I work with kids who exemplify that. But it's not just kids. and It's not just people where I work. I've got to have it. I've got to have that newest Nintendo. I've got to have that game. I've got to have that, that, that special cheat in the game. But you know, you go about three days without food and you could care less about that game. Pretty soon, the only thing that matters is eating. 
I don't know the longest you've ever gone without food. Not when you're sick. A stomach bug. Friday. Woke up in the middle of the night. Oh. Yeah, that's one thing. When you're feeling good, you don't eat. And I love how people say, oh, I'm starving. No, you're not. What's it been, three hours? When you've really gone. I remember when haying season would come in back when I worked on the farm. and Up where I grew up in Pennsylvania, they don't have sunshine. We call it shade shine because there's always clouds up there. Just the way it is. The really... Like we get here, blue sky days when there's not a cloud in the sky. They are few and far between where I grew up. We have blue skies, but we had the little saying, if you can make a Dutchman's pair of pants, it's probably not going to rain. Because the sky is usually pretty filled with clouds. But it can rain at any time because one of those clouds just might get heavy enough. and, And it's not raining there, but it's raining right here. And if you know anything about hay, once you cut it down, if it gets rained on, it ruins it. So when you cut down that hay, you have to get it dried. Can't put it away too wet. If you do, it'll burn down your barn, literally. It'll heat and mold, create, and your barn will go up in flames. So you've got to get it right to the right amount of moisture, and then you've got to get it in that barn. And so you can't stop. When I was working on the farm, we had a lot of hay to put in. We had put in 70,000 bales of hay. And I handled every one of them. And on those days, when the sun was shining, you were putting hay in the barn. Make hay while the sun shines. And it's hot work, and it's hard work, You try throwing several thousand 50-pound bales over your head like that, one right after another like this, and have to throw them 30 feet, every one of them. In a hay mow that's 130 degrees under a hot tin roof where if you raise your hands or your shoulders too high and brush the roof, you'll get burns. And man, you get hungry. And there's, there's no time to stop to eat. And when you finally got to sit down and shove something in your mouth, oh, did that taste good. Jesus said, that's what the will of God is to me. It's my food. Well, look over at chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 38. Still in John. John chapter 6, verse 38. For I have come It was a big thing a few years ago. The purpose-driven life. You have to determine what is your purpose. You need a purpose statement. Churches need a purpose statement. The purpose-driven church. Purpose is really, really simple. And it's universal. Here it is. John chapter 6, verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. I didn't come to do what I want. 
I didn't come to ask for what I need. I didn't come to be the center of the universe. I came to do the will of the Father. What's your purpose statement? Did you come close to Jesus's? And somebody's going to say, well, but, you know, I give a lot of money to the church or I give a lot of time or I, 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 I take care of the sick or I, 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 I. Look at how much I sacrifice. Remember what Samuel said? 1 Samuel 15.22 To obey. 1 Samuel 15.22 To obey is better than sacrifice. God doesn't need your sacrifice. God isn't up in heaven going, you know, if I just had five more dollars... I'll never forget. Oh. When I was a young believer, I was in my home church, and a woman got mad over what was happening in the church and was making a big fuss and was, was running around gossiping, and it was a bad situation. Finally, it came to the head, and the woman showed up at church, and after the service, when everybody's talking and milling around, she's screaming at the pastor, and she finally gets up in his face And she points his finger at his chest and she goes, if you don't do whatever it was, my husband and I are leaving and we're taking our money with us. And the church treasurer, financial secretary, whatever it was, who who counted the money, was over in the corner and said, do you ever hear one of those public whispers? You know, you say something that sounds like a whisper, but everybody in the room hears it. She goes, I think we'll live without your dollar a week. And the discussion was over. God doesn't need our dollar a week, or our hundred dollars a week, or our thousand dollars a week. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We're not going to impress him by what he does, by what we do. All he wants is for us to obey. And and it's not like Jesus says, do as I say and not as I do. Jesus showed us what that means. in the most costly way possible. No human being has ever done what Jesus did. No human being has ever taken all the sin of the world upon themselves. Not one. And the only person that can understand what Jesus did, the only way that you can possibly understand in any small measure what Jesus did is to go to hell yourself. The only people that will understand what Jesus did, the agony He suffered, why He said, I don't want to do this, is the people in hell who understand the price He paid. Jesus doesn't say, do as I say, not as I do. Jesus did the most costly obedience there ever was something that no person in heaven will ever have to fully understand what it costs. And he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. So, here's my question as we close today and prepare for the Lord's table. What obedience is God asking you to do today? 
what does God want you to resolutely set your face toward? What is there in your life that God says, this is where I want you to go? Let's bow together. Oh God, I thank you that salvation wasn't just a little thing that we can do and it's all over, but you paid the horrible price because we owed the terrible debt. And no person who's ever truly redeemed will know the depth of that debt because only those who suffer forever in eternal fire will understand how horrible it is. So I ask you, O God, in light of your mercy, in light of your grace, touch our hearts today that we might be able to turn from our ways and embrace your ways, from our thoughts and embrace your thoughts. May we resolutely set our face to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen.